I got this for a price of $5, and that was because there was no guarantee as to whether this worked at all. And in fact, looking at the screws, there are three screws and a bunch missing. And if you look at the back, the same story happens. The schematic showed that this uses two tubes, and one of them I also got at the hand swap while I was there, because I figured, you know, this probably won't work. So one of them is 64, this is a triode, and the other one's a 1287, which I was not able to find at the ham swap. This tube also cost me $5, so at this point, at the swap, I was down $10. The third thing I did get to get this thing working is these connectors. Now these connectors aren't your regular BNC connectors or anything like that. These are threaded, and they're, they're quite shallow. There's a center pin here, but it's, it's flat, it's flush against the... Uh, the center part here, the brown part, and it's been poked out a lot. You can see there's kind of a like wire scratches and things like that in the center conductor. So I dug around, I figured out uh, that these connectors were actually microphone connectors. I bought two of these, one for uh, input, one for the output, and I put this cable together just now. Um, the way it works is, you can see the center there has a hole and there's a set screw on the side. When you take the set screw apart, you're left with this springy bit, which goes over the coax and the braid, and then your center conductor of the coax simply sticks out of the top here, and you solder it down. So, put a bit of solder on there. That's why this is scratched up, by the way. This isn't uh, an issue with the connector and the panel, but it's just because this wire needs to make contact with here. You're putting pressure of the center pin here onto the connector. So you screw it in just like you would uh, any other connector. And the center connector there it makes contact with the center. And I'm not a fan of this connector. It's a little bit tough to get in because the, the depth here is really shallow. My goal for this video is to kind of figure out whether this thing works or not, whether I can use it for debugging a little bit of uh, some of these radios that I got that aren't working because I need to modulate the input, which is why I got this. First thing you notice is that this thing was built by somebody and they proudly put their name on here and also their location, Vassar, Michigan. Uh, so this unit was actually sold as a kit of parts. So you got a pile of parts and you put it together. What I really want to do now is kind of figure out the price of this night generator in its original form. I've started digging through QST magazines in hopes to finding an advertisement for it, but I wasn't as lucky as to find a direct advertisement for that particular kit. What I do have is 1963 volume of QST, and in the April edition, uh, there is a mention, this is on page 168, by the way, there is a mention of Knight. So the Knight did not advertise in 1962 or 1964, and this is the only year where I found Knight advertising in QST. So I think I was pretty lucky in trying to find almost a needle in the haystack because, you know, we've got a billion pages here, and most of it is uh, Halicrafters and things like that. And it looks like RCA bought out the entirety of the back covers for most of these QST uh, back in the 1960s. So there we go. Taking a look at the T150 transmitter, which is not our unit, but you know, give a sense of the pricing. It is $119.95 in 1963 dollars, which just scales up a lot for today's money. There are two things I want to take a look at here. One is whether Allied Radio still exists. It says 100 Northwestern Avenue, Chicago, Illinois, so that probably doesn't exist, but we'll take a look at Google Maps in a sec. So I was curious as to what happened to Knight on 100 Northwestern Avenue. So here's the building in Google Maps, thank you to Street View. Um, there is no more mention of Allied Radio or Night anything. And in fact, uh, if you look over right here, you see that 100 Northwestern Avenue is actually now the Illinois Department of Juvenile Justice, Illinois Department of Employment Security, and a children's home. So obviously Allied Electronics or whatever is not here anymore. But taking a look at the building from the satellite view, you see that this property was quite sizable. And also, it's good to know that Knight Electronic Corporation 
is a subsidiary of Ally Radio. So Ally Radio would be the company that sold these things. So what I did was I dug up a catalog from Ally Radio in, in 1963 that actually mentions the night uh, kit I have here. So here is the catalog I was looking for that had the prices. 1963 seems to be the magical year that I needed to be finding, and I found it. So here we go. We got the night kits from page 1 to 69. Taking a look at here, because uh, the address matches, everything is good. And it looks like they have all manners of products in here. So the product that I was interested in it ended up being on page 58, which was took a little bit to find. But here is the generator app in front of me. It came with test leads, I can get those, but you know, oh well. Looking at the price, it's $19.95 for this generator. And this is a $19.63, so we can do a inflation calculator on that in a second. Um, if you want a factory wired, it's an extra $10. So that's probably a pretty good deal, but it, it, you know, that's a significant amount over this thing, this price here. And all the specs are here, and it's going to boast about its exceptionally high accuracy, and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, that's what I came to look for, was the price, and here it is. Heading now to the inflation calculator. Uh, we put in 1963 as a year, and over here I'm going to enter 1995, and I'll hit calculate. So, wow, that's actually, that's almost ten times the price here. It's 164 11. So this is, I guess, a price I would pay for a signal generator if it was new and it was working really well today, but you know that's, that's still a pretty big amount to pay for a signal generator like that. So how about if it was fully built for us? Well then that's $246. It looks like the inflation rate here is 722%, which is absurd. So there we go. That's how much this thing cost back in 1963 in today's dollars. So now with the history and everything sorted out, it's time to take a look at this actual unit. So I took all the screws off of this, and this simply slides out of the cabinet like so. On the back of the unit is one screw, uh, not a screw, and we've got a power cable, and that's really, that's really it. On the top is this handle. It's actually spring-loaded, which I find quite intriguing. You know, why go through the effort of putting a, a spring-loaded handle? And that's kind of nice. It's a nice touch. So here's the main tuning dial. It turns pretty smoothly. Uh, it turns the variable condenser in the back, and it's geared. So I'm turning the knob much more than I'm turning the actual condenser. There are five knobs down at the bottom. This one controls the modulation, so you can either have modulation from inside the unit, or you can feed a modulation signal into here, and that modulates your RF signal, which outputs on this cable. So for normal operation, you'll select external, and that'll just give you whatever the, the machine wants to give you, as indicated on the dial. Modulation gain tells you how much uh, modulation you want, so the higher you turn it, the harder the signal modulates the RF output. Here are the band selectors. There's A, B, C, D, E, and that matches up with the five bands right there. And if you turn it to band B, for example, then you would be using the range from 550 kilohertz all the way to about 1800 kilohertz, or 1.8 megahertz. The power switch is next. Uh, this dot is misaligned, so if I turn it on, here, click. And you can see this light comes on also. This light is actually a little bit flaky, so if you, if you jiggle the, the unit, uh, the light will come on and off. And this also acts as a RF output control, or essentially a volume knob for the RF signal. The higher you turn it, the bigger the signal is going to be. And finally, we have the attenuation knob. So we have a high, medium, and low setting, and that's pretty self-explanatory. Also, this RF attenuation is set up so that this is labeled coarse, so this gives you a big step up or down in terms of uh, attenuation, and this is your fine-tuning control, where you set your knob to wherever you need that to be. Now, looking at the back, we've got two transformers, our variable condenser, and two tubes. 
and also the pilot light over there. Uh, on the schematic, we've got the first transformer here. It does the input for the tube power supply, and the second one goes to the AF oscillator. The variable condenser can be tweaked uh, via the knob in the front, so if I reach behind, you can see that the variable capacitor turns. Overall, the top of this is pretty clean for what I expect. You know, this is really not a huge amount of dust here. I'm picking up a little fine grain of uh, white particles, but it, you know, it's for the most part, it's pretty good. Really, isn't a huge amount of dirt or grime. Um, the way these uh, outputs are put together is just a single piece of wire coming up. Now, let's take a look at the underside of this. And looking back on the schematic, the frequency is generated by tweaking the capacitor in parallel with some of these uh, inductors here. And the inductors, there are five bands total, so we'd expect five coils. And there's an extra one here that's fixed. All right? The switch is right here. We see the two uh, levels, which are these two gang sections of the switch. And as you rotate through them, you select which coil you want seeing these colorful wires branching off uh, to the coils and then you select your frequency band all right uh, next we've got a fuse so this fuse here is actually not part of the schematic and i don't think it's original the way it's uh, mounted is through a sheet metal screw onto the back right there and this hole is supposed to be for the back screw that holds the case into place there is a screw through this hole from the outside, and obviously you can't put one through here because there's already a screw facing the opposite direction. So whoever built this decided to put a fuse in, which is good. Uh, the fuse is still intact. You can see the uh, the fuse inside. All right, and we have a big orange capacitor here that is probably not very good. Um, so that's 150 uh, MVDC. So it's at 150 volts, uh, it's not millivolts, right? Millivolts makes no sense. And it's 20 plus 20 microfarad. So there's two uh, capacitors in here. We've got this side, there's two terminals. And you can see that better. There are two terminals on this side. And the other side of the capacitor is connected to ground. So here is a mod. It looks like we've got a line running to a silicon diode to one leg of this device and let's move that out of the way a little bit more you can see that the other side has been desoldered and connected well, this red wire from here goes to now the other end of the diode so this thing here must be a diode and in fact if we take a look at the schematic there is only one diode in the entire schematic and that's right there on the power section of the power supply. And this acts as the half wave uh, rectifier. So obviously, whatever this thing is, broke and we got it replaced with this diode. So this thing is a selenium rectifier. It is an in-between for a diode and a vacuum tube. The vacuum tube says here it drops 10 to 25 volts, but this thing only drops maybe 10 volts. Well, compared to, to a diode that only drops one volt, you know, we've improved a lot since then. But these things are apparently toxic, and if they heat up, it's not good for you, and they produce smoke, so we should really get rid of them. But the issue is, you really have to be able to simulate the operation of the selenium rectifier if you're going to replace it in circuit. So what you do is put a resistor in series, because you want to account for the voltage drop. And the equation is given here. Now I checked the uh, voltages on there already, and this diode drops 0.2 volts both ways, so it's not a very good diode. Maybe it uh, likes to operate at high voltages, but I was testing it at low voltages. Uh, this diode uh, drops 0.57 volts, So, and this is a properly operating diode. The diode it says E8. Uh, I've already sprayed some uh, contact cleaner onto these all these switches and potentiometers. Now let's take a look at uh, these tubes here. I've got a 12AT7 and a 6C4. The 6C4 is a single triode, and if you take a look on the schematic, it's used for the audio oscillator, which is this pile of stuff down here, 
and this section. The other tube is a dual triode, that was a single di triode, so this is a dual triode that drives the RF, and this is the RF oscillator bit. So this tube oscillates with these capacitors and those inductors that can be switched and tuned. The 12AT7 is this one on the left, and the 6C4 is one on the right. Uh, the 6C4 is actually a different tube that I have, it's not the original. Uh, the original tube, 6C4, tested bad in my tester. So before I even turned it on, I replaced it. Here's the original 6C4. You can see that there's a, a Knight logo on there. It says made for Knight. So we know that this is the original tube. The 12AT7, on the other hand, um, is actually a good tube. And it's a Raytheon tube. It probably is a replacement. And what I did was I took this out for a test, and I put it back in, and I accidentally made a small crack, a hairline crack, right down the side there. I don't know if you can see that. But it still works, and just so you know, the vacuum doesn't come out, I think it will be fine. So my mistake was that I, I pushed down like this with my finger on the corner here, so I guess don't do that. Uh, just hold the sides and push down that way. So put that right back in. Just give it a wiggle, all right. So I won't use the original light tube, and I'll just use my replacement here. So now it's time to take a look at the signal output this generates. So I essentially recorded a bunch of sweeps from bottom to top of the band, and I'll go through bands A, B, C, D, E really quickly, and you can see that the signal doesn't look very good, and I'm not the first one who's actually noticed this issue. If we take a look at a couple other clips here, um, I'll just let you hear what people have to say about it. There we go. That doesn't look too bad. Um, this waveform, I think, is typical of these cheap uh, kit uh, RF generators. I'm not too worried about the way the uh, about the shape of the of the waveform here. I'm more concerned about the frequency. I have it uh, on external modulation so that we have no modulation. This is all RF here. So the first thing you can see is this uh, this waveform here. It's it's, it's kind of weird. Um, it's not really much of a sine wave. So part of the issue with how the signal looks is just with the parts they had available at the time, and part of the issue is things like the selenium rectifier and, you know, things like that. So for now, I think that's going to be about it. What I'm going to do to this thing is I'll look at the schematic again and see if I can make the power supply a little bit better, and I can fuss with it in the next video, but... For now, you know, I know this works pretty much up to as good as it was going to work at the time of when it was supposed to be built. So I won't bother with really mucking around with it too much in this video. So we saw the signal coming from this thing isn't the prettiest, but uh, there can be some things that can be done to it. And the first thing might be just to be replacing these uh, selenium rectifier diode um, combination up in the corner here with a proper silicon uh, full wave rectifier and then you gotta watch the voltage and everything make sure everything still works but that's a project for a different day right? that's not something I could do really quickly here so essentially this is where I'm gonna leave this for now and there might be a part two in which I try to make this thing perform better but for now this does exactly what I needed to do I had a modulation input output and I can still test units with it, and like it says in your manual, you know, you can do a good amount of testing. So, that's all for this video. I'll see you later.